Our second panel of today is on the challenges of improved energy performance in the subsidized housing sector, in the affordable housing sector, so to speak, where price signals are expected at least to a first approximation to be weaker, uh, but not necessarily but where the benefits are expected to be larger, uh, but again, not necessarily. The first person to lead this panel is Ophelia Bascal, who's regional administrator of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Region 9, which includes the entire West Coast and also Hawaii. Ophelia served for more than a quarter of a century as the executive director of the housing of... <laughs> nah. Yeah. She recently served as the executive director of the Housing Authority of Alameda County and as vice president of the, of the Pacific Gas and Electric Company before her appointment as regional administrator by the Obama administration. So I turn the proceedings over to Ophelia. Thank you, John. That did sound kind of harsh, didn't it? Quarter of a century. <laughs> And I want to tell you how old I am. That's all right. Um, anyway, well, I'm delighted to be here today. And I think this is going to be a very interesting panel. You have a number of experts here on this area of energy efficiency and affordable housing. Um, an important issue, just for you to know, HUD spends about $6.8 billion a year on energy costs, either associated through um, basically subsidies that go to private property owners and public housing authorities for energy costs that they directly incur or for utility allowance, um, basically uh, allowances that are given to families who are residing in private housing. So there is, um, while there's a lot of things going on in the, the field in terms of HUD and, and energy efficiency, uh, particularly with the ARA funding, uh, there was about $300 million that's going into replacement housing, new construction, ensuring that it's um, energy efficient, meeting new ENERGY STAR standards. Another $3 billion going to housing authorities to do energy upgrades to the properties that they own. And, you know, about $300 million going to existing owners for energy retrofits. So an area of concern and an area of interest, one of the main goals that HUD is tracking um, in terms of looking at improvement in energy efficiency in both stocks um, that are, are owned. One of the things I wanted to do, though, was because and I'm not sure everyone in the room is housers, is to explain to you the concept of utility allowances in um, affordable housing. So you heard that, for the most part, tenants pay about 30% of their adjusted gross income towards rent. And I just want to run through a very simple calculation to show you how it works, because it has implications for the um, incentives to tenants and also impacts policies that have been developed to create more energy efficiency in affordable housing. So let's say that, you probably, that a tenant has an income, an adjusted gross income of $800 a month. So 30% of that would be $240 a month. That would be their rent calculation. You subtract from that a utility allowance that is based on the size of the unit that the family is in. And the utility allowances, for the most part, are established by housing authorities. They're used, the housing authorities' utility allowances are used for low-income housing tax credit projects, and um, generally the owners of privately owned affordable housing also will look to the housing authority's utility allowances. So in our example, we have a family paying $240 a month rent before the utility allowance deduction. So let's say the utility allowance for the particular unit that they're in is $40. Their rent then is not $240, but $200. And the presumption is that they take that $40 that they you know, have had deducted from the calculation of the rent and use that to pay towards their utility bill, whether it's actual or not. The utility allowances um, that are developed by housing authorities, uh, there's not really a science to it. Um, <laughs> Nehemiah's laughing. It's less than a science, I guess you would say. Um, and it varies depending on how sophisticated they are, whether they use consultants to develop them. It's supposed to be based on the actual use of a modestly consuming family. And, um, but I can tell you, when I used to be the director of a housing authority in Alameda County, my utility allowances varied by as much as $25 to $30 from the Oakland Housing Authority, and we were in the same county. 
And um, because we got very specific about using PG&E's climate zones, and we drove all our tenants to sign up for the CARE program, and so we, we had lower utility allowances. Did the tenants actually have lower utility costs? Who, you know, who knows? I mean, you know, surveys are not that uh, extensive in terms of what people do. So just understand that you've got a lot of variables out there impacting where we go with this. Um, so that's just by way of a little bit of a background on this. And a key thing on the, um, the utility allowance is to see if you got it. So let's say you do a lot of energy efficiency and you decide that utility allowance shouldn't be $40 but should be 20 does the tenant benefit from that? No. Yes, they well, they get comfort, but do they benefit dollar-wise? They pay more rent, right? So that's an important thing to just, just remember when we go through this. So with that, a bit of background. Um, you have everybody's bios in the, um, in the, the program, so I'm not going to go through those. So we're just going to go ahead and start with some really brief um, opening statements to kind of uh, establish some fundamental information here. And I'm going to start with Wayne Waite. He's going to talk about federal state problems and challenges and some of the structural issues that exist in the program. So Wayne. All right. Thanks, uh, thanks Ophelia. I'm Wayne Waite with HUD. Um, and uh, a further point on the utility allowance discussion, if the public housing authorities get it wrong, it, that it being too low, the, uh, that excess burden is picked up by the uh, by the low-income household. And uh, GAO did some studies back in the 1990s which showed that that level of tenant participation was, was pretty significant. So um, it's, it's a pretty important uh, issue, I think, to, to get right. Um, with, uh, with over, I don't know, 35, 40,000 properties and 2.5 million housing units, and, uh, and that's just what we directly support. There's another two and a half million vouchers that are uh, provided directly to low-income households. You think, that, uh, you think that HUD would be a real ideal client uh, for, for energy efficiency. Uh, the buildings we support, as uh, been talked about today, were largely built prior to the energy code, about 85% of them. 65% uh, built prior to 1970. Um, the Department of Energy Information has further looked at public housing and lower income uh, households and found that uh, they typically lack uh, up-to-date heating systems, the appliances are very old, um, water heaters uh, particularly is a big, uh, big issue, I think, in multifamily housings. We have higher, as Nehemiah pointed out today, energy costs, which is BTUs per square foot in multifamily dwellings. So uh, it's a fairly sensitive uh, uh, issue. I, um, the other aspect I think that I want to kind of bring into play is that with respect to the investments, there's a lot of deferred investment out there in public housing. Just the deferred investment related to energy efficiency investments is 6.4 billion dollars over a housing stock with about 1.1 million units. So just shy of about $6,000 uh, a unit. And uh, it, within that, with those kinds of attributes, it's no surprise, as Ophelia pointed out, that we're spending uh, $6.8 billion a year in energy costs. And that represents a, a pretty darn big uh, fiscal outlay for the department, a large part of our budget, and quite, quite frankly, a big uh, opportunity cost in terms of providing affordable housing across the country. So when you spend $6.8 billion on, on energy, you're either the Department of Defense or, uh, you know, to borrow a riff from Elvis Costello, you're a, you're a boy with a problem. And, uh, and, and I'm a boy with an asset performance deficit problem. And, uh, and Nehemiah, that's APT and, and, and not uh, ADD. So, 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 um, now, we, we've made some, I think, some fairly significant efforts with, to address energy, this uh, asset performance deficit uh, in the Recovery Act. Both HUD and DOE have introduced a lot of fairly innovative program models. These are new, hadn't really been seen before. And, uh, you know, on the multifamily side, there was a program introduced called the Green Retrofit Program. And it was basically the first nationally scaled whole building performance-based multifamily program in the country. 
um, comprehensive set of improvements applied. This program introduced the first uh, uh, first physical needs assessment that incorporated fully green building and energy efficient energy efficiency concepts, um, and that is. Uh, an important tool that we'll, we'll get to a little bit later. And in, uh, the other important thing that it did is that it, again, for the first time, provided different sets of incentives to the property owners to begin to address this split incentive issue problem that, that we've talked about earlier, um, so that the pro owners have a stake uh, in both uh, the transaction and the brain damage you have to go through uh, as well as the performance savings at the, at, at the back end. On the public housing side, what the Recovery Act programs demonstrated is that the public housing authorities um, are quite capable of designing capital improvement plans that increase their portfolio by 20% or better. That was a threshold in the funding that went out. The proposals that were received all were to achieve 20% or better um, um, energy savings. Um, uh, and then we also applied a nationally uh, established uh, investment criteria developed through by the enterprise uh, communities uh, to that program. So we demonstrated that with respect to investments, we can apply criteria like that on a national scale, criteria that Bill Paveo in California is using now, but, uh, but not HUD. So uh, we've demonstrated that it can work, uh, work nationally. Uh, at D with DOE, um, uh, what we did with our partnership is we pre-qualified about 1.5 million units um, under that program. There were 12 new models developed in states um, across the country that uh, really are next generation multifamily design programs. They upped the level of effort and the, and the scope and really called into question just the some of the defects, I think, that, that we've seen in the design of multifamily programs across the board. And uh, it also expanded efforts in, in 28 other states. About 10 states, I think, had a kind of a status quo and hands-off multifamily. Um, but in those 28 states, I mean, the, the efforts were pretty su substantial in California. Uh, uh, Berk, or Oakland, uh, San Francisco, it developed the first whole building uh, energy efficiency programs in the state uh, through, the, through the WAP programs. These are fairly comprehensive programs, and they really should be distinguished from what we might think of as utility multifamily programs, or utility supported multifamily, or ratepayer supported multifamily programs, because they're really comprehensive. They're, they're not limited by the the assets uh, or the, uh, the feasible measures, um, which really equate to just minimal investments right now, and, and we're just not there. Um, so when all is said and done with the R programs, uh, we will have touched about 10% of our assisted inventory. Um, not bad. Um, but we have uh, a bit more to go, and uh, we have a bit more to go without the benefit of ARA or Recovery Act funds. So moving ahead with 90% or so of the inventory to go, uh, our footing, I think, is a little bit less certain. Um, uh, hopeful, maybe, uh, but uh, certainly less certain. Uh, just different studies across the country, uh, one in particular by the Eisenhower Research Project uh, at Brown University called The Cost of War, uh, talked about this cumulative effect of this $4, billion, uh, $4 trillion eventual cost. Um, and they projected or estimated that it would result in about a 27% reduction in energy efficient renewable programs supported by the federal government. So we're moving into a landscape now where it's not really certain whether um, energy efficiency is, uh, is going to be an established budget priority uh, like it was under the Recovery Act. And I think there's some questions as to whether it will be a policy priority or what the shape of that pri policy priority will be. Um, um, I think that's uh, an important question. Um, if it's not a, pro a policy priority, I think we're, uh, we're uh, directing or encouraging our, our stakeholders to kind of wander through uh, uh, the ravages of a, a once promising uh, policy landscape, uh, and we're asking them to do the right thing. Um, um, and uh, by putting together rebates and uh, relying on the kindness of strangers, 
uh, like uh, like climate uh, savvy Scarlett O'Hara's, um, and uh, I, I don't think that's uh, necessarily a desirable outcome. And and according to uh, Raphael Bostic, who who you're going to hear from later, um, he basically said that it's not enough in a recent HUD publication to rely on our stakeholders to do the right thing. Um, a charity, is, he said, uh, is not, and I wrote this down, not a business model that we can uh, bring investments to scale. So uh, we have to kind of dig deeper, I think, into our own self and try to see what some of those solutions are. Um, there are three issues that I want to briefly outline, which I think shape really kind of some of the key challenges, including the, this whole issue of regulation. Um, the first is the data gap, okay? The vice president's uh, task force on recovery through retrofit uh, really emphasized the, uh, the importance of in good information and basically concluded that neither the co consumer or the financial markets had really good information. Well, it gets worse at HUD, okay, because um, while we know the cost of things, $6.8 billion, w we don't know what we consume. And when you don't know what you consume, um, how do you know where to target investments? Or how do you know whether your buildings are efficient rather relative to an efficient building? So we have some data challenges, I think, internally that uh, we're going to need to work through. Um, and um, the landscape gets a little bit more challenging because not only do we not have good consumption data, but we don't really measure um, the right thing. Um, ARA, uh, it, and uh, as a few of you mentioned, we now have for the first time a performance goal in our management plan. And it says we're accountable for improving energy performance. Well, we're widget counters. The way we count that is number of units touched and it dollars invested. Uh, information on outcomes right now is out of reach. Uh, what we don't know is whether or not the investments we're making achieved our energy expectations. Uh, we don't know if the energy burdens of low-income households have actually been reduced. We don't know if those investments have reduced uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I think importantly, we don't know really how those energy efficiency investments have affected cash flows at properties, uh, residual receipts, or really the financial stability and affordability, long-term affordability of, of that asset. So we have some questions that are not yet at our dinner table. And, um, you know, in short, we know kind of what we're spending. But we really don't know, and I think as Alan's, Alan's point today, we really don't know the value of energy efficiency to the agency. And this is something that um, we're, we're going to need to address, I think, to develop a coherent uh, set of policies. A second challenge we face is uh, that the financial uh, markets for affordable housing still lack financing products um, and good decision-making tools. This was covered uh, today, I think, really well, really well by, by Matt. Um, he emphasized, I think, the importance of private investments, private markets, in, in getting to scale. Um, there is just not enough public funding really around to, to, uh, to address the capital requirements that we're seeing with, just within our inventory within a reasonable period of time. I mean, if we stretch it out 20 or 30 years, Maybe, you know, but uh, if we're trying to accomplish something in the next 10, uh, I think we're going to need to look to, to capital markets. Um, up to now, I mean, what we've done has been, been primarily through grant programs and tax credits. These, these programs have been just great uh, forces and great inducements for energy efficiency uh, and water conservation investments. I mean, the program in California is, is just a landmark in that, and, and, and Bill and his team there are, are really to be committed because they, they've established some really good uh, standards. But um, they're, I think to use Matt's word, um, they're, they're bribes, right? <laughs> um, and maybe, maybe not really bribes, but um, uh, they're really public inducements to do something that is not really being done well, I think, just within uh, pr private markets. So we need to address uh, that issue. And I think to, uh, the good news, I think, on that front is that what ARA did is, I think, broaden 
the concept. Uh, it decoupled energy of investments from kind of normal life cycle investments of, of affordable housing. So the grant programs were for new construction and rehabilitation, and we were able to kind of roll some added investments as part of a broader financial package. Uh, these programs that came out of the Recovery Act were very targeted at energy efficiency, and so we have some very good models, I think, to get us to this point. The, the less exciting and maybe more troubling news is that the financial markets really haven't responded, even with the ARA inducements. Um, and uh, where you see them working at all is um, in cases where there are typically higher interest rates in play and higher transaction costs. So they might not reach the value proposition that's needed for an affordable housing property to kind of get in the game. Um, the other thing that's um, not existing right now is really good decision-making tools. Now, um, HUD has made some efforts, I think, with the Green Physical Needs Assessment. Uh, physical needs assessment are really a standard part of underwriting. Uh, we've greened it. Uh, we've updated the cost comparative concepts of doing, uh, incorporating green measures as part of uh, physical needs assessment. But that tool has not yet been widely adopted within financial markets. I think that's uh, intended and a direction we're going in, but not yet, uh, not yet accomplished. And despite the fact that we have kind of the largest national inventory of properties in the country, we still don't have across business, our HUD's business lines, a really standard protocol for doing energy audits. Um, everybody's kind of doing their own thing and uh, with, uh, you know, more rigorous or certainly less, less rigorous standards. And so we, we don't have that and, and we don't have a consistent set of investment guidelines yet. So we, we have a bit of work to do. Uh, last point on financing is that, um, you know, as, as far as the um, financing re retrofits from energy savings, which is really kind of like the holy grail of uh, energy efficiency financing. If you can finance it from savings, again, great. Uh, as Matt pointed out, we just don't know enough about the predictability, certainty, and accuracy of those, those projections to, to make it work. The case where it does work is with energy performance contracting. And uh, HUD's had a bit of success in that area. The, the problem is that those are typically pretty complex transactions. Um, you know, HUD nationally, we've done 213 EPCs through 2009. About 235,000 units have been touched. And uh, we've leveraged investments of $729 million. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty, pretty robust, but at the same time, um, you need high technical competencies to make these things work. Um, you need uh, large portfolios to really attract ESCOs and to reach economies of scale. And uh, it's not available to assisted housing yet. Um, and uh, it's also a product that also requires significant guarantees beyond what the ESCO might bring to the table. Be a great segue to, to go to uh, Matt, who I think that's going to cover part of his presentation. So, great. thanks, Ophelia. Before I jump into the um, case study in energy performance contracting, I just wanted to quickly talk a little bit about a California perspective on affordable rental housing. A uh, couple of quick sets of facts: uh, HUD has roughly uh, two hundred thousand assisted. Uh, low-income apartments in California. So of the numbers uh, Wayne was giving you earlier, about 200,000 of them are here. Um, the average income of people in those units, I actually didn't check, but it tends to be around 20% of median, Ophelia? Yeah. Uh, if you add in, Bill Paveo from the Low-Income Housing Tax Credit Allocation Committee is here. Bill, I think you have about 250,000 tax credit-assisted units here in California now. It's about right. We have about another 40,000 uh, directly publicly owned assisted public housing that uh, Wayne was also just referencing. That's actually relatively low to our per capita population versus other states. Uh, we only have about three and a half percent of the country's public housing. We have a little bit of uh, rural uh, section 515 uh, rental housing, about 20,000 of those units. And this is the mystery number. I'm looking at Kathy Cresswell, our acting director, state director of housing. 
I th I'm thinking there's about 90,000 to 100,000 of state and locally assisted housing that is not otherwise tax credit housing or HUD housing. But it's a little hard to pin down. So if you add all those numbers to up together, you get about 600,000 affordable rental homes with some type of federal or state assistance with rent regu regulations, typically uh, starting out now in the range of 55 years. Uh, in the public realm, we hope it's permanently affordable, but there is no guarantee of that. So that's just the universe I wanted to start with that we're talking about here in California. Wayne earlier mentioned uh, a great thing that HUD and the Department of Energy did, which is to pre-qualify, pre-determine the el income eligibility of uh, as many of those HUD-assisted properties as was possible for certain types, certainly the weatherization assistance program, and we hope ultimately some state programs. And in California, 100,000 apartments. Of those 600,000, roughly 100,000 got on that list, where HUD was actually able to use its own computer system and, and verification, income verification systems to put those on a list. And that's a big achievement. Uh, but I also want to have a little reality check here. I'm going to make a point about this. As of June 30th, and maybe Wayne has a more recent number than this, only 668 of those 100,000 affordable homes had been reached with a federal weatherization program. Tiny amount. Uh, why, why is that? I think it's an important question if you're in multifamily uh, housing, if you're in affordable rental housing, to ask. And I'm going to give you one partly simplistic answer. There's, there's, we have a bit of a cultural problem here in the energy retrofit weatherization sector, which is people are generally used to thinking about single family home weatherization and retrofit. A lot of our older programs were designed with single family homes in mind. So if you happen to be in charge of a portfolio of over 10,000 low income apartments, as my colleague Ann Silverberg is, and you're trying to access any of those resources, it can be incredibly frustrating because the rules and regulations are really set up historically uh, for single family housing and individual rate payers. Um, you know, we have representatives here from the California Public Utilities Commission, Kathy Fogel, among others. And that system uh, really focuses on benefiting rate payers, and there's a great logic to that. But if you're a building owner and you're trying to do the right thing, you're trying to save energy, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and maybe in some small ways, despite Ophelia's point earlier, which was well made about the utility allowances, in some small ways, adding to the comfort and uh, reducing the cost of energy to low-income residents, it's pretty difficult right now. So I just wanted to start with that as a context um, and then now I'm going to take us into an energy performance contracting case study because I think this is really important. It's one of the few real success stories we have in financing the retrofit of low-income housing. So first slide, please. Be great. Or, thanks, Larry. So this is just quickly, uh, I, I am also a commissioner for the San Francisco Housing Authority. Uh, I am going to be here. Uh, at risk of taking credit for work that uh, I didn't really do myself. Actually, one of the people who worked in this, uh, George Gager, used to be with San Francisco Housing Authority and worked on some of this. We have other housing authorities here. Uh, Monterey is here, Starla Ward, who've done their own retrofit work. But I wanted to give you an example. So here's a housing authority that has a large amount of publicly owned housing, uh, San Francisco specifically. Uh, not all of that is traditional public housing. Some of it's in other programs, but it's roughly uh, 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 that amount. The average income you can see uh, is about as low as you're going to see in any form of housing. 12% of median um, is, is pretty much at the bottom of what you're going to get. The subsidy that HUD is providing through the public housing program uh, this is an interesting debate. When I um, talk to energy contractors, who I've been talking to a lot more in the last two years than I've ever talked to uh, in my first 18 years in the field, they say, well, why are you here advocating that uh, HUD-assisted housing and public housing get any portion of these ratepayer retrofit funds? I mean, the federal government's taking care of all of it, Wayne, isn't it? Well, the reality is for any of you in the field, uh, that's actually not true. The federal government does not provide 
subsidies, notwithstanding the ARA programs that we discussed earlier, to actually retrofit buildings. And you can see the amount given here is not actually enough to operate the buildings. Uh, San Francisco accumulated a capital backlog of $270 million of major capital needs in these uh, 6,500 public housing units and, and, and related units. You know how much San Francisco gets every year to meet that need? On the surface, it sounds almost reasonable, 13 million. But half of that 13 million has to be used to pay for operating deficits that are intentional by the way co uh, Congress and HUD have to budget this program. So there's about $6 million to work on $270 million of capital deficits. I'm not talking about energy re efficiency right now, just basics. And that deficit goes up by somewhere about 18 to 20 million a year. So this is a losing proposition. So just for those of you in this room who are not familiar with this, please do not assume that because something is funded by the US government that it's taken care of. <laughs> Next slide, please. Here's a graphic of the picture of the capital needs versus the capital funding from the US government. And, and really, it's Congress's decision. It's not HUD's, HUD's decision. HUD's trying to do the best it can with limited resources. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, Wayne mentioned this in passing. Uh, this is the energy performance contracting basics that HUD has set up. And uh, Wayne, did you want me to go through that, or did you want to take, take the group through this? If, if, I mean, if I could help. Please, uh, go ahead. The, the two finding, financing concepts that I think are relevant here and, and probably the most important are the frozen rolling base that you see up there and the add-on subsidy. Uh, the way uh, these transactions are financed is that uh, a baseline established once a public housing authority elects to do an EPC. Uh, and what HUD does is freeze the um, operating uh, portion of the assistance for utilities uh, at the sites covered by the EPC. Uh, and those are frozen for the period of the energy performance contract. Uh, the savings that are derived uh, uh, must be used to cover the debt service. The guideline is that 75 percent of those savings must be used, uh, the, which is an incentive to the public housing authorities who can use the other um, 25 percent uh, for um, other capital-related uh, needs uh, in, the, in their portfolio. Uh, the other way these are financed is through an add-on subsidy. And again, once the uh, properties and scope of work are identified, um, um, the investment costs are determined, and there's an annual add-on subsidy to the operational uh, portion of the budget that's provided to the housing authorities. Uh, the way the scope of work is defined is through a, what's called an investment-grade audit. So a uh, energy service company, typically, that's selected to run the project will do a high-end audit and go through in detail what they see as the energy savings opportunity, particularly water conservation and you have a scope. Then begins the fun part, the negotiation, and that's where you need somebody like George or, or you know, to really represent your interest uh, with an energy service company who has a lot of interest in making a lot of profit. I just want to draw our attention to that last bullet, because that's critical. It gets to the issue of incentive and ability to do fin financing. So HUD is allowing essentially 75% of the savings to be used to finance the cost of the improvements. That's critical. And uh, we're, I actually hope we'll have time to talk about uh, some ideas about what HUD could do with the privately owned housing um, a little later. Uh, but the 25% is also critical. Maybe a little less critical to a public housing authority that is not profit driven, but is really hard pressed just to maintain basic operations. So it really is a, is a motivation. Uh, next slide, please. Can I ask a clarifying Yes, question? please, go ahead. Is, um, are those savings actual savings or projected savings? Okay, so I think the next slide will start to get at that. It's a very good question. So the, uh, the way the savings and the way the financing works is all around this energy service contracting company. Uh, and there are, a lot of Fortune, there are a number of Fortune 500 companies that are now in this area. And I actually think this is another topic that's uh, worth some exploration later. And the San Francisco Housing Authority essentially did an RFP, request for proposals, and selected, in this case it was Amoresco, 
Amoresco, uh, in turn, is at least on paper not only doing the energy investment grade energy audit, but they're taking uh, financial responsibility for the savings. They are actually guaranteeing the savings. Now, I'm, I tend to be pretty practical. I've been in low-income housing development and financing for 20 years, and I've seen a lot of guarantees. <laughs> I'm not sure that we would actually succeed in collecting on this guarantee, which is why when we go out to the bond market to finance this, that guarantee was not sufficient for the bondholders. So we had to back that up with two things. Uh, first of all, collateral in all of the uh, fixtures that are installed, which goes to Amoresco as the ESCO. And secondly, our uh, full faith and credit as a housing authority, which is limited to, of course, things that are not otherwise pledged under contract to the US government. Um, but it still is worth something at this time, you know, uh, to, if you think S&P ratings have any value, uh, the city and county of San Francisco had an A rating, and that was used uh, successfully in the bond sale. Um, so I, I don't really have a complete answer for you, but other, on paper, the ESCO is confident enough of its predicted savings that it is putting its financial balance sheet at jeopardy. Um, other parts about the ESCO... Uh, well, let me just cut to the chase. So 123 million of potential uh, capital uh, energy-related needs were identified. About 30 million of them were eventually settled on as things that could generate enough savings and meet the other requirements of the program to be worth doing. Uh, to make that $30 million, uh, $30 million available, we had to essentially agree to about a $34 million financing. And, uh, there's a more complicated story about how, the, what the type of bonds that were used, the financing that is not the subject today, we're gonna to skip over. I know George knows way too much about it. But uh, the bottom line is we did use tax exempt bonds and there is potential later to use low income housing tax credits. Next slide, please. So here's a quick overview, and I'm sorry it's such small print, of some of the energy conservation measures that were included in the ultimate package that was agreed to uh, between the ESCO and the housing authority. Um, and the water, water ones feature prominently. I think several people here today, uh, Nehemiah and Wayne among them, have really stressed the, 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 the need to focus on water. And um, I think that's definitely something we should come back to. But I also want to point out that domestic hot water systems, uh, a little more than halfway down, are a major component of this. Uh, also, there are HVAC systems included and space heaters. Uh, these are items which right now are excluded from ratepayer programs that would possibly serve multifamily rental housing uh, for, for cost effectiveness, uh, two reasons potentially. One is alleged lack of cost effectiveness and the other is the uh, concern that uh, state law says that landlords have to provide all heating, cooling, and uh, ventilation and therefore uh, there should be no assistance to private landlords from ratepayer funds uh, with any of those functions, even if it's just to increase efficiency. I think some of us think that's uh, actually a misreading of state law, and um, we may be able to prove that sometime soon if we can't resolve it otherwise. But this is a little overview of the measures. Can we turn the page, please? Yes. Cogeneration. Uh, I actually don't know exactly the type of cogeneration. George, are you familiar with ex exactly the, is it steam? That's, yeah, okay. Thanks, Ophelia. Yeah, so I'm supposed to wrap this up quickly. The next page just gives you a quick graphic of the um, savings versus costs. Um, I'm not gonna have time to really get into this, except if you go to the last bullet on the left, the energy conservation measures based on the projected savings, here's the point, will pay for themselves the water in 4.3 years, the electrical in nine years, and gas in 20, over 20 years. So I'm gonna stop there. There are two more slides we can come back to later if we have time and turn it back to Ophelia. Right. Thank you. So now we'll go to someone who's actually running a property and making those choices, Anne. So uh, I'm Ann Silverberg, and I work with Bridge Housing Corporation. And uh, I'll try to talk qu quickly, but not too quickly. You can slow me down if you uh, if you if you need to. But um, I'm going to uh, give the from the 
trenches perspective, as Don Turner used to say, for those of you who knew Don. Um, we, uh, for those of you who don't know, we are a nonprofit affordable housing development company. We're based in San Francisco, but we work all throughout California. And uh, we've been around for about 25 years or 27 years, and in that time we've developed um, over 13,000 uh, homes for uh, seniors and families. And uh, we're a long-term owner, so as we develop housing, we keep it in our portfolio. And so our portfolio is growing all the time. We have about 80 properties in our portfolio right now. And uh, I'm going to move this mic back so I can sit up a little bit better. All right, um, so we have about uh, 80 properties in our portfolio. Um, Bridge is really uh, concerned with quality. Quality is part of our mission. It's really important to us, and it's important to us not only when we're developing housing, but as we're uh, owning the housing over time. It's really important for us uh, to maintain that quality for the residents. And so, uh, uh, as, a, as a sort of um, just to underscore the importance and the commitment to quality, our board in, um, a couple of years ago. Uh, decided to uh, create a new team at Bridge. It's called the Portfolio Management Team, and that's my team. And our group is really focused on our existing portfolio, the properties in our portfolio. We're outside of the day-to-day -day asset management and day-to-day -day property management. We actually are charged with the task of uh, looking at our projects, really taking a 360 view, looking at the physical, financial, operational health of our properties, identifying needs and opportunities, and then coming up with a plan to address those, and then implementing that plan. And green, greening our properties is a really important part of that view. So we've been thinking a lot about this. Um, you know, we're trying to take some of what is standard for new construction in the way of greening and renewables and energy efficiency and bring that to our existing portfolio because a lot of our properties were built before we were all thinking about this or maybe we were thinking about it but not quite doing it yet. So um, that's part of what we're doing. So let me talk a little bit about how we've approached it and then I'll mention a few of the challenges. I think we might be talking a little bit more about that as we get to some of the questions and, and further into the conversation so I can elaborate. But um, uh, you know, long before the portfolio team was developed, our property management company started with some energy efficiency, and they addressed what some people call the low-hanging fruit, which is really, really important work, but, um, you know, kind of the basics of, of energy efficiency, upgrading the lighting, occupancy sensors, low-flow faucets and, and plumbing fixtures, um, uh, uh, weather stripping, a variety of, of tactics like this. And so they've run through most of our portfolio and what they haven't yet done, the portfolio group is now trying to complete. And that's kind of the basic. Now we're trying to take it up to the next level. And we have uh, in the past and continue to uh, approach our projects one at a time with a particular energy efficiency or renewable. Um, and an example is a property in San Francisco where um, photovoltaic panels are being installed today. As we speak, they're going up. And um, Bill Paveo and Kathy Creswell both have financing in that particular project. So it's a win-win-win for the three of us here. And we're very, and many more, obviously, uh, not just the three of us. But we're really excited about that. But that's not where we're gaining the most traction. Where we're gaining the most traction in bringing green measures into an energy efficiency into our buildings is when we are uh, approaching a building with a larger scale rehab. And as our buildings age, and I don't think Bridge is unique with this, as our, our industry's buildings age, we really need to be on top of the uh, renovations that are necessary. And we're finding that some of the major systems are reaching the end of their useful life, and we need to replace those. We sometimes have water intrusion that we need to address. And this rehab goes beyond the level of the reserves, um, and so we need to bring in new capital. And as we do that, we are able to bring in enough capital to address uh, a, a number of other issues and bring in another a number of other upgrades that we wouldn't otherwise be able to. So I'll give you an example of another San Francisco property. This is not the same one that I just mentioned, but this is one where we do have some water intrusion envelope issues that we need to address. We have some useful life issues on our big major systems, including the roof. And so we are in the process right now of refinancing, resyndicating, or bringing in new lenders, new investors, uh, keeping a, a lot of our old friends in the deal, uh, in 
including Kathy, uh, at HCD, and um, really then amassing a pile of money that we can use to address all of the issues at the property. So we are uh, addressing the envelope issues. A lot of the water intrusion is centered around the windows, so we're going to be replacing the windows as part of that, obviously with energy efficient windows, which is going to be a tremendous benefit for the building as a whole, for us as owners, and for the tenants as well. Um, we've been criticized, I, I've spoken about this in the past in, in a group of uh, 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 energy folks, and we were criticized at, uh, for uh, approaching windows first, saying, you know, if you look at the payback schedule, windows are not at the top of the list. However, for us as a building owner, given that we've got these issues that we absolutely must address, address windows are at the top of our list. So we need to make sure that we're matching our priorities so that we can get more work done. On that particular building, we're also replacing the roof. So we're, we're uh, uh, replacing it with a more thermal resistant roof and reflective material. We're putting PVs and solar thermal. We're addressing water with irrigation and landscaping and hot water heating. So we're able to do a lot of things as we're addressing the, the physical issues that, that absolutely had to be addressed. So that's where we're gaining a lot of traction, I think, in the, the greening and the energy retrofits. Um, this work is not without challenge and, and not without barriers. And um, you know, I think that some of the, the points that were raised earlier uh, about the capital markets, I think that that's true. We're finding that lenders still aren't underwriting the projected savings. And I think that as we collect more data and we can show the savings is, is going to be realized, we might actually see uh, some movement there and that would be really positive. I think there are a number of other barriers, including properties that are, I'm sorry to say, HUD finance properties where the incentives are not there to provide the green. And I have another property that we're working on right now, renovation, it's a refinance of a 202 and the incentives aren't there to do the greening and we talk a lot in the office about how we wish the incentives were there and what can we do about this and how can we fix it and I think Matt is making some great progress in proposing a solution that might work for that. So I, I think while there are some barriers we're making some progress but I'm really encouraged by these conversations because I think the policy approach and the new ideas are really going to help us all as an industry move forward on the multifamily affordable arena. If I may, just on the question okay. of lending. So at a recent gathering sponsored by the MacArthur Foundation in Living Cities in March of this year, the head of uh, Bank of America's CRA Lending Division was asked, so if you had good data, will you ever lend against energy retrofits? His answer was unequivocally no. <laughs> so I just want to throw that little bit of cold water on us, because I'm not sure the banking industry Thanks is going to come back here. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. All right, and we'll have Steve give his. So I'm Steve Raphael, I'm a professor of public policy, and I've, I've done some work on affordable housing, but not at energy retrofit, so I'm feeling a little outclassed at the table here, which is a fairly common feeling. Um, but what I wanted to offer is some comments about uh, the potential relationship between energy retrofits and housing affordability more generally, and perhaps try to be a little provocative. Um, since I'm sitting here, I might as well do that. Uh, and the, the thoughts I had were the following. If, if we think about, when I think about sort of the, the demand or the need for affordable housing, I think of sort of two segments among the low income population, you know, all of which oftentimes are low enough income and have low enough assets to actually qualify for assistance. And those are those that receive benefits and those that don't. So in the United States, housing assistance is not a uh, entitlement. You qualify, and if there's a unit available and you're far enough up on the list, you will get assistance. And the majority of people who qualify don't uh, receive assistance from the federal government and are paying uh, rent at market rate. So uh, we, we heard today that people who receive assistance, their income devoted to housing and utilities through the housing allowance is capped at 30%. But it's not uncommon for people in the bottom fifth of the income distribution or households to devote up to a, f a half of their income to shelter and utility expenditures. So uh, in thinking about this conversation, I've been trying to think of various ways that, that efforts to green buildings might impact the overall level of affordability, taking into account both those who receive benefits and those who don't. 
So the, the first thing, uh, question that I'd like to ask, um, and then also maybe just offer this up for further conversation later, is this issue of uh, whether or not devoting resources to, to greening buildings and subsidizing these efforts might be diverting uh, resources away from covering more people. It doesn't sound like a whole lot of money is going in this direction, but nonetheless, um, uh, given that the primary uh, um, sort of purpose of housing policy, low-income housing policy, is to adequately house people and that there's a lot of unmet need, uh, this is something that comes to mind immediately for me. Uh, and now more so when I think about sort of state and local efforts to regulate energy efficiency among uh, low-income housing producers. So we know uh, from, from various, actually a fairly large body of research now, that the more we regulate uh, the construction sector, the higher the sort of average level of new construction, the higher uh, rents tend to be, the higher rent burdens are for low-income people the more likely they are to be crowded and frankly the more likely they are to sort of experience a spell of homelessness and uh, to the extent that efficiency or energy efficiency mandates are going to add to those costs i would expect like other uh, regulatory uh, sh uh, stringence imposed on on the housing sector that that could perhaps aggravate those problems although magnitudes of course are a matter of debate um, w within the housing sector and this this is one of the reasons why I asked the question before about whether the savings were projected or actual. If I understand the conversation here, it sounds, I mean, my guess would be that the projected savings would result in a reduction in the housing allowance. Is that correct? Is that? Yes. Yeah, and the housing allowance and an increase in the rent of, of the owner. So um, we heard several people this morning uh, tell us that there's actually a great deal of variability in terms of the actual savings that we get from uh, various uh, uh, energy retrofits. And of course, when there's uncertainty, somebody has to bear the risk. In the case of a single family retrofit, it would be the individual making the decision who undertakes the loan and has to pay it back. In this instance, it sounds as if perhaps the resident of the public housing or of the public housing unit is the one that bears the risk regarding whether or not there are any savings. Um, so uh, I just want to throw that out there for, uh, for conversation. And that's it. So I'm done. Well, thank you. And before we, we open up for audience questions, because if we're going to raise some fundamental questions, I think an interesting question is, is why are utility allowances at all part of housing costs that is subsidized by the federal government? I mean, you know, there's, it's, we could go through the whole way we calculate income, you know, giving medical allowances and other sorts of things. It, it really masks the actual cost. And so, you know, those are big policy questions. Maybe when, you know, Assistant Secretary Bostic is here later, I mean, that's a, that's a really good question to sort of pose is, is this how you, is this really housing costs? So, um, you know, Wayne laid out that, you know, the, the R dollars are going away. And so I think I would ask uh, maybe Matt. So with the federal funding role diminishing, how are the states and practitioners going to adjust to that? What, what other options a, are they? It's a great question, and it's one that uh, my organization and others who we're working with, some of whom are in this room, are wrestling with. Um, right now, there is a low-income energy retrofit program that's funded by all of us in this room as a ratepayer program. It's overseen by the California Public Utilities Commission. The, um, the name that you may have heard that it used to be known by is the Low-Income Energy Efficiency Program. It has now been changed and rebranded as the Energy Savings Assistance Program. That program uh, is managed by the investor-owned utilities statewide. You, know, you think, oh, let's just keep it simple. It's PG&E for just for a, lot, a large part of the state and certainly this part of the state. Um, statewide, about a little over 300 million a year is budgeted for the program, about 325 million. Um, and so just let's pause there. 325 million a year for retrofitting housing in which low income ratepayers reside. So uh, I can argue this both ways. On the one hand, that's a huge amount of money in the low income housing sector. On the other hand, the mandate that the Public Utility Commission has given the investor on utilities is you must offer services to every 
eligible households in the state of California by 2020. So when you work that out, the, um, the way the incentives work is for the utilities to focus first on touching, offering services to units, and only secondarily right now on energy efficiency and savings, or even comfort. So um, I, I want to tie this to a question, a very provocative, good question that Stephen put on the table. Or would we be making a mistake focusing resources like this ratepayer resource on uh, publicly assisted, rent regulated low income housing? Wouldn't we be better off trying to help the other 75% of eligible households who aren't lucky enough to be in one of these programs? And philosophically, I could definitely embrace that. But let's look at the reality of, uh, and there are many energy contractors, by the way, who totally agree with that perspective. They only want to work in the market rate buildings. They don't want to work in HUD buildings. In fact, they claim that HUD, HUD has plenty of money and they shouldn't be, be helped. They go into a market rate building, um, pick your favorite low-income neighborhood, that, because to be, to be eligible, remember, this is 200% of federal poverty, which actually discriminates against California as a high cost area. It's flat, it's not adjusted for cost of living at all. We have disproportionately few eligible households, especially in these areas like the Bay Area. But putting that aside, those buildings are mostly gonna be in less good neighborhoods uh, with landlords who don't have as much capital to do things. Some might call them slumlords in some cases. We don't really know the, in its particularities. So that energy contractor goes in and spends $1,000 retrofitting some of its overhead, some of its light bulbs and weather stripping, maybe a new appliance, that low income apartment. The energy contractor goes away. Right now, that landlord would be free, unless they're in a rent controlled city, to increase the rent as much as the market will bear, as much as the market recognizes the improved comfort and possibly the energy savings value of that apartment. Further, the landlord could turn around the next year and sell the whole building. So what, what portion of that benefit, of that public ratepayer funding, just went to the low-income household? There's absolutely no guarantee. Contrast that with a, uh, let's just say, a Section 202 for the elderly development, a HUD, HUD building owned by a Bridge Housing or any other of the other nonprofit organizations. Um, that building is, is, if not permanently, at least long-term rent regulated. The rent is not going to ever become unaffordable, no matter what investments are made. And what we're doing by investing that $1,000 in that unit is we're extending the life of the building, we're increasing the comfort of the low-income resident, and maybe if we can talk about some other proposals, we actually might be providing the tenants with some type of financial incentives and education. So I, I just wanted to make that point. And those are really good points. And I think actually what we'll do is we'll, we'll open it up for questions. And one thing I think you might, I'd be interested to hear is you heard that Bank of America is not going to loan regardless of what data you have. So the question is, are we measuring the wrong things? Is there something we could measure? Do people have ideas about ways to capture the attention of the financial market? So let's start right there. Um, it's on. It's on. Thanks. So I just, uh, in a way I'm following up, I'm responding to your question perhaps indirectly. I wanna make sure I understand what I've heard in the panel about what's actually known about the results of programs like this. Because Wayne said that uh, HUD does not have sort of the, in, you know, the systems in place to measure outcomes of these investments, if I understood you correctly, and pointed out that you had aspirations when you get results to approach the private financing sector uh, and that. Uh, Matthew, your your these results are ex these numbers are ex ante, right? So, what is what actual ex post measured results are there for what you all are trying to do? And um, on my remarks this morning, were I was thinking about the single family retrofit dwelling, but there is also a history on multifamily retrofits, and you know it's the the data are in some cases old, but it's not uh, terra incognita. Is Bev here somewhere? There she is. I mean, Bev and I worked at PG&E together. She's like an expert on energy efficiency. PG&E actually has some pretty good data about the impact on consumption and things of the measures, as I recall. Yes, and I... 
Um, I haven't looked at that data since um, 2006, unfortunately. So can you, can you repeat what you were looking for? Yeah. Well, my, my question was to the panelists overall, um, talking about the, the efforts that are being made here. And I was wondering, in the course of planning, um, financing, all the rest of it, what actual ex post measured outcomes are, are in this system, are in these decisions? Yeah, my recollection, we had almost any data you could want, um, which is <laughs> that, you know, you've got the numbers of the homes, you've got the income levels, you've got the measures you've done, you've got the KWH and Therm saved, you've got the how that goes by, I think we had it either by county or by zip code, or so there's there's quite a bit of data in the system in terms of impact. So, well, are, is this for what was formerly known as the LIE program? Well, for all our all the low income programs, we had extensive data okay. collected. What I'm asking on, is is results in California, silly that have gone through sort of the the California value. You know, I think it's different for low income housing, but uh, measured savings, you know, third party evaluation, and uh, whatever it takes to actually, uh, you know, the, I don't know if you any of the term are you familiar with the term realization rate? It's uh, utility and efficiency program jargon. Uh, for the ratio between what actually gets saved and what was projected. And, you know, it's always been true that the realizations rates are characteristically well, befo well, befo well below one. And so presumably th those kinds of, uh, that kind of information is available here and might inform what we're hearing. Well, and it's not just through the utilities because there are also measurement, for the folks from LBNL here, anybody work on measurement and evaluation? Because I know LBNL had done studies on that as well, and so the utilities were often the recipients of those studies. But then we had our own data. So, but there's there is quite a bit of data. I, I can't tell you exactly what report has it. It's been a long time, but um, but it, it, these issues were extensively studied. Before we go to Nehemiah, and I just would say that. Um, I find it really interesting how we see things develop in terms of networks. Roland Risser, who also was at PG&E, who's now at the Department of Energy, has a lot of this issue is problematic because you can, there's privacy issues in terms of how the data can be released, but has um, managed through relationships with SCE and, e, SCE and PG&E is now gathering enormous amounts of data on this to be able to try to drive between you know, what's the actual realization versus what the projections were. But, No, right, right, because yeah, I'm every... I'm responding to the impression I got, and maybe I was dis disimpressed, that there is no ex post data available for what you would have covered. There's, I think what Wayne was saying is there isn't for HUD specifically, and I'll just... For HUD specific programs, there, there are a few exceptions to that general premise, and one is energy performance contract, which has a measurement and verification protocol established with it. Uh, that's a condition of the approval. And second, some of the ARA programs uh, were, were beginning to get back-end uh, data because we actually had releases signed, uh, so we're doing data collection. But uh, what we have now is not a lot, Just and and that that was the point that I was trying to make, and and that was what we're hoping to resolve. Tanima, uh, this is specifically to Alan's question. Other, uh, um, if you go to CalMax website, they all. I'm sorry. If you go to CalMax website, you can see all of the valuation reports, and there's a very recent one. I think it was June, on um, LIEE uh, program, um, but. Uh, you, when you, when you look at the results of any of those evaluations as they're applied to low-income housing, you have to take it with a huge grain of salt because the same criteria for evaluating the pro, for programs for somebody in affordable housing is essentially applied to, to, you know, to, to Walmart, to, uh, to you know, uh, the McMansions. I mean, the, it's the same criteria. And, and, those, and, and you shouldn't be valuing the same things the same way in affordable housing as you are in other things. It's, it's, the, it's one set of criteria applied across all, 
and you know the realization rate is is a manufactured number that you have to be, you have to believe in the assumptions before the realization rate makes any sense and i guarantee you for for the uh, low income programs it does not make sense and a lot of the other assumptions that are built in to the analysis don't make sense there's more value gained from it than the evaluations say well, maybe we'll, maybe we'll, maybe we'll we can, move we can on. Take, take we'll we'll come the back if there's some other questions. So there's, I think, somebody right up there in the center, and then I'll get you over there. Hi, my name is Anna, and my, I'm actually a foreign student. I'm from Sweden, uh, and I have a question for you. I see, for, for the entire panel, I see some sort of... Uh, there's a lot of difference in how the economic situation is explained. You can either explain it as win-win-win, like there's, uh, you can have energy efficiency and then a lot of uh, different stakeholders can uh, make a gain from that. Or either you can put it as a lose-lose-lose situation that, <coughs> for example, this is a question about loss or greater loss because we have been uh, we have had far too cheap energy water food everything has been too cheap and now it's getting more expensive and there is investments to be uh, to be made and someone has to pay uh, so uh, what do you think is there a question about win 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 or is it loose 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 <laughs> steve you can have that one <laughs> well um I guess I'll try to answer it. Uh, why not? I mean, I, I, I would think win-win-win depends on, on how you define who your constituents are. Um, to the extent, for example, that, that bridge housing can provide more housing by making, because they can do things at lower cost and expand their portfolio of properties, then everybody wins, right? To the extent that uh, it concentrates more benefits on their current recipients at the expense of a project later than the winners are the incumbents and the losers are the people that would otherwise have been housed. So I don't, I don't know how to think about these things. I don't know what the magnitudes are. Um, but of course, I'll find out right now. So. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify my win-win-win uh, comment because it, it is not a financial gain for anyone. So I didn't mean to imply that. So no one is patting their wallets with this. What I mean to imply with, or what I meant by that directly, is that uh, by adding photovoltaics on this particular property, it lowers the operating expenses, and it's not a lot. But it's significant as you're running a, an affordable housing development because what it does is it reduces the pressure to raise rents to keep to cover expenses over time. So you might start out and you've got a, a comfortable margin between rental income and expenses, but over time your expenses are rising as as a result of increases in utility costs and a number of other things as well. But we really try to keep our rents low, and as those lines get closer and closer, we look for ways to relieve that and bring down expenses so we don't have to raise rents to keep everything uh, in the black. And so the fact that we were able to bring in the, the, the solar panels and reduce our energy costs means that we can keep the rents low. And that is consistent with our mission as well as the, the mission of the funders who were originally in the project. So that's what I meant by that. I just wanted to clarify for everyone. To add a point, to add a point on that, uh, the win-win, the and I think to, to relate it back to kind of Steve's issue about the opportunity costs. Um, uh, Matt, in the earlier panel, talked about power purchase agreements with solar. And within the affordable housing communities, that is the predominant form of financing for solar and affordable housing, even with the MASH program. It's really the solar investors that are leveraging that resource with the federal investment tax credits to put up solar arrays on affordable housing. Uh, that doesn't create the opportunity costs, I think, that you're talking about in terms of taking away housing program assets uh, from de developing new uh, new facilities. Um, and it does, depending upon the PPA provider, provide a means for the uh, housing provider to actually realize some of the, uh, some of the savings themselves. In other words, um, the charge, the cost charged by the solar investor may be substantially less than what you're currently paying PG&E. And in that scenario, what, what, is, what will occur is that the operating receipts in the property will increase, uh, which then raises the question, well, how do you get access to that? And that, that is another regulatory barrier. That... Do you have a question up here? 
Okay, I have a question for the HUD representatives. Uh, my name is Gordon Wozniak. I'm on the Berkeley City Council. And we heard earlier a problem with multifamily retrofits is a split incentive problem. And in Berkeley, it's particularly challenging because we also have rent control, which doesn't allow you on like 80% of our units to raise the rents if the property owner does make the investment. But HUD actually has the Section 8 voucher program, which about 8% of the units in Berkeley are funded by that, which pays, it has two benefits to the property owner. One exempts them from rent control, gives them market rent even though the tenant only pays 30% of their income. Uh, and, and potentially HUD could use this as a leverage to encourage energy retrofits. Or, or uh, My understanding I remember is there was some flexibility they assign the rents based on a survey, but there was some flexibility between 90 and 110 percent of the local agency, and potentially you could pay a slight premium for property owners who invested in energy retrofit, and you have for uh, HUD housing that's you know affordable housing nonprofit, you allow some return uh, you know for this for the savings. You could work out an agreement between the property owners on how the savings were split, which is very difficult you know, with rent control because you got to do it on an individual basis. And so I, I, my question is, is would HUD be sympathetic if there was a proposal from Berkeley to, uh, and, you know, uh, utilize your leverage in some ways to encourage energy retrofits so for me, Section 8 voucher housing? Let, let me just speak to the voucher side of it. Um, you know, somebody would, in determining the market value of the rent, you'd have to be able to actually demonstrate that the value... Is, is there in the market. In other words, you'd be able to have to be able to do some comparability to show that people are willing to pay more if the building was, in fact, retrofitted and you refactor that into the rent. But on the other side, theoretically, you should lower the, the tenant's utility allowance to take that into account. So the tenant doesn't actually benefit. Do, do you get a better property in the long run? Maybe. But then we're back to the question that Steve's raised about, then you raise rents for the people who don't have the vouchers. So, I mean, theoretically, is it possible? Yeah, but I think it's, it's got complicated issues with it. On the project-based side, there's barriers. You just, the way the, the rules are set up, you don't actually get to benefit from the increases. That, and that's one of the things that's problematic and needs to be addressed, so. So in, in, in your scenario, would the, uh, the property owner need to receive a rent increase then to capitalize the energy improvements? Well, not necessarily. One is uh, there is a value to this Section 8 voucher. It says uh, HUD could require, for example, there be energy audits to receive vouchers. I mean, this is one thing, you know, to get things started. Second, as I said, if I remember, there's some flexibility um, in, you know, not only the market survey, but where you could set it at, 10% higher than market survey. I don't remember what the conditions were. The question is whether the, 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 uh, the owners today, without a, a, a change, an amendment in the rent, can finance and capitalize the energy improvements on the, because you mentioned that it's a rent controlled building and they're getting a fair market rent you know, where if it was uh, a non-voucher holder, they may be the rent may be, may be restricted, right? So the, 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 the owner of the building is already benefiting, right, from what they would otherwise be benefiting. So are they looking to benefit some more through a, an increased rent? And if so, I mean, uh, if that's where you're going with it from going from 100 to 110% of FMR, I think that does get to Steve's point, is it becomes an opportunity cost issue. Because you have a public housing authority with a specific budget that's providing vouchers. And if you're uh, allocating more money to individual vouchers, you're in, in effect serving less voucher or eligible households in, in your community. So that, that would be the policy issue. There, that, there are yeah. two separate questions. Yeah. The one is you say if it, it's rent control and there's a low rent, they can charge market rent. HUD could have some conditions that you have to do some, uh, you have some green rating of what the building should be or some, uh, you have to do an energy audit or whatever to receive that 
additional subsidy in, in the Section A. The other one is yeah. whether you would get an additional increase. We can probably talk about this offline because I think it's actually more complicated and whether you could actually finance it, but good question. Is anybody over, how about over completely on that side, and then we'll come back here. Um, I'm Hilde Mile, and I work in the local government sector, um, city of El Cerrito, and I'm looking at this sort of going back to the last session, Matt Golden, sort of I'm a realist, I'm not an optimist or a or pessimist, and I'm looking at sort of the overall financial environment and looking at affordable housing, multifamily housing as a subset. It's a special market niche. We've got extra sort of regulatory, we've got extra subsidies, and our market is changing. Redevelopment subsidies are, are likely going away or will be severely constricted in some form. So that's a source that's going away. Um, our goals have been to dramatically increase production, at least in the state of California, um, because we know there's a great need out there. But our finance, our finances are, are getting more and more constricted. Um, and just in the local government sort of sector, I'm sort of struggling with what role does local government play, if any, other than um, you know the local entitlement planning approval regulatory body? Um, and looking at the portfolio of affordable housing in my community that I do have and feeling pessimistic about the ability to create new housing in my community, new affordable housing, and perhaps shifting my focus to preservation of what I do have and how I can be more involved and active in that role. But what do you see as sort of, in looking, in sort of hearing this discussion, I don't think we have, we're not there yet in terms of um, funding preservation and renovation of what we do have, let alone adding the energy efficiency component that we would like to do, um, but just let alone the, the asset management function. So I, I'm just, I guess sort of my realistic assessment is we don't have the resources to even preserve our buildings, let alone get to energy efficiency. But so just wondered if there's any comment on that. Sure. Oh, I'm just gonna take a quick uh, shot at responding. So in San Francisco, in Oakland, and I believe also Berkeley are working together on, a, as Wayne said, a comprehensive energy retrofit program where they're combining scarce federal and, and local housing resources with uh, federal weatherization assistance program funds. Uh, I'm not sure if there are any ratepayer funds yet uh, involved in that mix. But uh, so that's one thing uh, that can help. There's also, I know PG&E has a, uh, I feel you may be able to help me with this, a uh, local government partnership program. Mm -hmm. And I know in San Francisco, I heard someone talk about Energy Watch earlier. San Francisco is using that to create a kind of one-stop shop uh, place where uh, the owners of these buildings can come in. And part of the frustration, if you're in Ann Silverberg, is to get your building served, you have to navigate you know, a dozen or more potential incentive programs, uh, leaving aside even the low income program, and how you get access to that. And Energy Star, for, Energy Watch rather, my brief experience with it, seems to really help. Mm -hmm. But not every county has chosen to adopt that. Not every city is participating. So I would just throw those out. So I think we have time for maybe two quick questions. And we'll, how about there? Okay. Uh, thanks. So I guess the skeptic in me is wondering, I think we're here all thinking about equitable housing access as a main driver, but I'm not sure that all the players here are really have that as their main agenda. Um, there's the issue about climate change and trying to meet these goals, um, energy savings, and those are sometimes overriding the desires for equitable housing. Um, and so I'm just wondering how that plays, because I know that that is part of this challenge in this, going back to the opportunity cost, is what are we, what are the funders looking for at the end of the line? And it may be different from what you're looking for at the end of the line. How do we make those come together? Well, I think it really, I mean, it, it, it varies by who the funder is. And I mean, if you're a utility, you're trying to meet the goals that have been established, you know, in, in AB 32, and you have greenhouse gas emission things that you're looking to do along with standards of PUC set, you know, basically HUD's concern is can we bring costs down, improve comfort in the units? So I don't know that you would ever get, you know, it, it's a it's something that's over overlaps and people have different views depending where they sit. I don't know whether anybody briefly maybe Anne. 
Um, sure. You know, I, I can give you our perspective. We're, a, you know, as I mentioned, a nonprofit, affordable developer and owner. And so our perspective on it is a matter of balance. We have you know, scarce resources, as was previously mentioned, uh, not just for our new pipeline, but our existing portfolio. We feel it's really important to take care of that portfolio. But if we have a choice of spend valuable resources to save the world or to uh, maintain our affordability and our assets or do new, new development, you know, those are hard choices. We're probably not going to go with save the world. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, gosh. But, you know, I mean, we have to make those hard choices. And that that's why I think part of the question of incentives in HUD programs, you know, with the 202, do we do something to promote energy efficiency if that money then goes away from that project? And then we might have to worry about, you know, something down the line. That Creating those incentives so that it stays with the project and is maintained for our resident, that makes sense. So I, th I think that might get it some of your... One quick fact on that. Well, we're Please. taking it up there. Go ahead. Sorry. The energy, if you're at the Energy Commission, think about the fact that low-income households consume 27% more energy than other income households. For starters. And our buildings, Wayne really talked about how much older the buildings are. And if we have a way to finance the improvements, we will do it. Mm -hmm. You don't need, to, if you can give us an on-bill financing mechanism or, or, you know, something like that, we'll get it done without you. Um, could you speak to whether this is already happening or if you see a future in which um, groups that are focused on affordable, sustainable housing are also working with groups that are focused on sustainable transportation, um, local, organic, healthy, sustainable food. So that's all sort of within an accessible area um, that people are interested in all three or use all three. Um, it becomes more of a message of you deserve to have all these things rather than who needs it and who actually has the money to afford it. Because I think sometimes I'm in the environmental field and we get into a bad habit either on purpose or by accident that we say you need money to do all those things and it's people who have money deserve it and that people who don't have money can't be part of it and we need to get away from that. So if you could talk to that, that would be great, thanks say that I think that finally HUD has sort of moved beyond the property line and is really thinking about communities and we're seeing a lot more alignment of the issues that you just raised. So for example, the sustainable communities planning grants and um, are really focused on EPA, DOT, HUD coming together to look at issues of transportation, costs associated with housing, air quality, all the issues that you've just raised. So I think we're moving more that way, but it's it's piece by piece, community by community. So I want to thank the panel. I think they did a great job. I'm sorry that we didn't have time to get to all the questions. Yeah, I wanted to thank Ophelia for organizing such a very interesting panel. We went on and we, we could spend several more hours discussing exactly these same issues. But we will take an hour break for lunch. And we, we will reconvene in one hour at 1 o'clock for the keynote presentation by Larry Gottlieb from KB Home. So we now have an hour for lunch served outside. Thanks very much. <laughs>